Well, I started out in, in psychology in a traditional program in, in uh, 1971 and it was a very Freudian kind of program. And I sort of enjoyed that because I, I like to be able to stroke my chin like a good Freudian and was pretty good at it. Uh, but I quickly discovered it didn't work very well. And in, in uh, 1972, an article came out in the Psychology Today uh, magazine that was called Where the Shapers of Behavior are. Uh, and in that uh, magazine, uh, they identified the major behavioral programs that were uh, around the United States. And I had begun at that time to show some interest in behavior analysis, primarily from a sociology class where we had Walden II as a text. And that was my first contact with Skinner, was reading that book. And I also had a, a philosophy course and had gotten very interested in uh, empiricism as a philosophical orientation and the two kind of went together and I ended up transferring to Western in 1973. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to stumble into a variety of things and one of them was uh, Dick Malott was teaching a Psych 150 class and he was uh, using much of the material from Whaley and Malott and uh, 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 Secret has a long history there as well as many other people. Uh, I worked in his rat lab and began to work with rats uh, in the Psych 150 system and uh, ultimately I became rat man uh, uh, in charge of 600 rats from a lot uh, and this was 1974 I believe and around that time the undergraduate advisor, because I transferred there as an undergraduate, the undergraduate advisor Rob Hawkins had suggested to me I needed to get some applied experience. I need to work with people if I ever wanted to get a job. I need to have that uh, kind of history. And uh, he suggested I go out and work at the Kalamazoo Valley Multi Handicap Center. And that was a program that was run by the Kalamazoo Valley Multi, uh, Kalamazoo Valley Intermediate School District. And the director of the program was Jerry Shook. Some of you may know Jerry as the, the founder of the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, and Jerry was our, our boss, and he had set up a program that provided behavioral intervention programs and services for about 60 or 70 children and young adults between the ages of, of I think our youngest was maybe one and a half or two up to 25. And the unique component of that whole program, and this is where I totally stumbled into probably what is the first large-scale ABA program that uh, was in existence within the public schools. That is, the entire program was based on behavior analysis. All the staff came from the Western Michigan University Psychology Department. They were, uh, everybody had to do a 10-hour internship their junior year, and they would come out and, and work uh, at the Kalamazoo Valley Multi-Handicap Center with Jerry. And uh, every year, every semester, Jerry would hire five, six, seven, eight, nine staff for part-time, and then there were uh, full-time positions, and ultimately you could work your way up the hierarchy. And uh, there were research opportunities or a variety of things to do. But the environment out there was, we're working with severe behavior problem kids, all kinds of problems, not only autism, but emotional impairments, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome kids, a whole variety of, of kids. And the way the system was, uh, the children came to the program is that they were either on their way to the state hospital, Kalamazoo State Hospital, this was the last step before they were institutionalized, or our program was their first step out of the state hospital. And so again, we got kids that were really difficult to work with, but yet everybody working with the kids, and, and uh, again, we're uh, all coming from Western Michigan University, everybody that worked with the kids had a very solid behavioral background. And let me give you a quick idea what that background was. When you went to Western, as a freshman, 18 years old, your first course was Dick Malott's Psych 150 Rat Lab. Uh, that was your first semester. Second semester was Bijou and Bear's child development material in, in uh, human development with Psych 160. Your third semester was Abnormal Psych, and we used uh, Ullman and Krasner textbook. Uh, so we kind of learned here's how to work with animals, here's typical human development, here's abnormal development. Your second semester of the sophomore year, you took Jack Michael's verbal behavior class. 
And so here, most kids who are 19, 20 years old, we're now taking verbal behavior. Uh, your fifth class was now uh, called Applied Behavior Analysis. So your fifth class, which we use uh, science and Human Behavior and, and, and other uh, supplementary textbook, Whaley and Malott, uh, other supplementary textbooks, and you also had this 10-hour internship. So now, after in your fifth course, you are now going to go out and apply the behavioral principles to children. Uh, the sixth class was the experimental analysis of behavior, and that's where we had the textbook by Honig. Uh, and, and so you look at that, that foundation of skills, so here are people coming out, working in this program with these kids who already know the basic principles. They already know uh, how, to, how to work with them in, the, in a laboratory setting. They know about child development. They know about verbal behavior. And now they're learning the procedures of applied behavior analysis like prompting, fading, shaping, generalization, discrimination, training, and so on. But they're applying them. So you look at this setting where the entry-level student has that history. Now, there were probably 100, 200 of us as students and upper-level people all working together trying to solve the problem of these, the problems of these 50 or 60 kids in this, in this program. And it was such an incredible verbal community to, to be there and, and so exciting to look at kids that nobody had been successful with, kids that were severely self-injurious, that were aggressive, kids that were nonverbal, had never talked, 10, 12, 14 years old, had never talked, and for us to try and figure out how to solve uh, their problems. Uh, as, as students then stayed on at Multicap, I ended up working there for six years full-time with Jerry. Throughout all my graduate training, uh, I worked uh, uh, at that program and then went, went to, to Western um, uh, for the degrees. But in that setting, uh, we were very research-focused, and uh, we had weekly research meetings with uh, Brian Iwata and Jack Michael. And uh, every week, the two of them would come out. And there were other faculty from Western Michigan University that, that participated in the program. But uh, I, I took an interest in sign language only because the first child I worked with there was a 14 or 15-year-old deaf girl. And I sat down to work with this uh, uh, young lady and my supervisors told me, well, she's deaf and uses sign language. I said, well, I don't know signs. And they said, well, she'll teach you. And I said, well, how do you do that? And they said, well, just hold up a, a picture of a shoe and she'll show you here's the sign for shoe. Or this is hat, this is book. And so gradually I learned uh, signs uh, initially from her. And then there was a, a deaf woman that worked in the program as well. And, and she taught a sign language class and I took her sign class. So I got interested in signs and this was all the same semester I took Jack Michael's verbal behavior class. So this was the winter semester of 1974. So that'll be, sadly enough, 40 years ago uh, this January. Is that right? Wow. Uh, 40 years ago this January, uh, I took Jack Michael's class and started working with this deaf girl, as well as several other uh, children from the multi-handicap center. And was just fascinated with how well behavioral procedures worked, how well we could shape new skills, how effectively prompting worked and, and fading and, and the basic procedures and how the kids so quickly benefited. But was more fun was interacting with this group of students and graduate students and very, very excited people at Western Michigan University in, in, in that environment. Now, Jack Michael, if we look at verbal behavior, Jack is ultimately the source for uh, most everything I would say that's happened in the rural behavior field in part by his teaching people what it was that Skinner was talking about in that book. Now the 1957 book Verbal Behavior uh, was not initially one of Skinner's most popular books. That is, the book came out and, and uh, there was a lot of opposition as you already may know from Noam Chomsky and, and others within the field of linguistics and psycholinguistics. But what Skinner didn't expect was there was a lot of opposition to his book from within the field of behavior analysis. That is, people didn't like it. They didn't like what Skinner did in that book. And there are a number of, of papers detailing this. But one of the big issues was uh, in the 50s and 60s, people were attracted to behavior analysis because of its empirical foundation, because of 
uh, its adherence to true science, and, 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 uh, which was very different from psychology at the time. So here they were attracted to an empirical science that was based on observable, measurable, quantifiable effects and so on. And here Skinner was speculating about the world within the skin. He was speculating about language acquisition, speculating about topics such as perception. There was a whole chapter in the book Verbal Behavior on thinking. And a lot of people at the time were very uncomfortable with Skinner kind of moving beyond the basic science. And, and Skinner talks about it as an exercise in interpretation, analyzing complex uh, uh, events, uh, realizing you may not be able to control or identify all those, such as uh, painful stimulation that might arise within the body. It may be hard to have access to that, and it may be only one person has access to that. So this whole concept of radical behaviorism, separating it from methodological behaviorism, was kind of at the heart of this book. Well, at the time, again, the people in the field weren't really interested in that, and also the applied field hadn't really emerged much in the 50s, uh, there was really no applied behavior analysis. The field began to emerge in the 60s, uh, primarily through, uh, again, the work of Jack Michael and Ted Ione with uh, their psychiatric nurse uh, as a, a behavioral engineer paper was published in 1959, probably the first uh, systematic application of behavioral principles to human problems. Uh, Don Baer and, and uh, uh, Todd Risley were at the University of Washington where Sid Bijou was. Um, along with Betty Hart, Jay Bernbrower. That was really the first systematic college program that set up a school that applied the procedures to um, children with autism. And in that time in the 60s, applied behavior analysis sort of came around. But, and, and Ivar Lovas was also there as a, a uh, postdoctoral student. Uh, Bijou tells the story of him and Bear and Wolf and, and uh, uh, Todd Risley working with kids and uh, Ivar Lovas uh, used to wander around in the hallways looking in the windows to see what they were doing with the children. And he was in the psychiatry department. And finally, Bijou said one day he invited uh, uh, Ivar Lovas into the school, into the lab. And uh, he basically never left once Ivar saw what was going on in there. Now, he had already had his PhD, but again, it was in psychoanalysis. And uh, he began to work with Don Baer and, and uh, Todd Risley and Mount Wolf and Sid Bijou. And in that area, kind of the beginning of what you might call discrete trial training, or ABA, uh, really began to emerge. But the issue was at the time, again, Skinner's verbal behavior was not really well known. There was not a, a lot of applications out there. The, the, uh, the book had conceptually been rejected by not only linguists, but by uh, behavior analysts at the time, with the exception of, of probably one person at the time, Joe Spradlin. And uh, some of you may or may not have heard of Joe, but uh, Joe's done a lot of research on conditional discriminations and such. But Joe's early work in, uh, 19, in the early 1960s, Joe Spradlin was the first person that I'm aware of that applied Skinner's concepts of man, tact, and interverbal to language assessment and language intervention. In 1963, he published what was called the Parsons Language Sample. And in that language sample, what Spradlin did was take the basic concepts of man, tact, and interverbal and suggest that the framework of receptive and expressive language was inadequate, which Skinner had, had certainly done, that ex the calling, uh, looking at language as expressive blended the useful distinctions between the man and the tact. That is, those are both called expressive language in typical uh, linguistics, and Skinner had suggested, no, they're functionally different relations, as is the interverbal. Well, Joe Spradlin created the Parsons language sample and really was one of the first people to kind of use Skinner's conceptual analysis to look at language assessment, then to do man training, to do tact training, and so on. Other than that, there really wasn't a whole lot going on in, in the 60s. Now, in the same time, ABA began to emerge. Java came out in 1968. The applied field really began to uh, come to life in many ways during the 1960s. But most of the ABA or discrete trial approaches to language used the standard expressive receptive conceptual foundation of language. Uh, uh, and then the procedures were basic behavior mod procedures. So Lovas's approach, which was really Sid Bijou's approach, Lovas and, and Bear and Wolf and, and Risley, uh, the, that discrete trial approach used prompting, fading, shaping, discrimination training, and so on. 
but the foundation of their language program was traditional structural linguistics, that is the expressive receptive distinction. They made absolutely no use of any of Skinner's work in verbal behavior. So in a sense you had behavioral procedures, but a very cognitive based analysis of language. Yet, as, as Bijou and, and, and Wolf pointed out in the early 60s, you could make tremendous gains with kids just by knowing when to reinforce, when to ignore behavior, how to get rid of your prompts. That is, those basic behavioral procedures were very effective in, in creating change for individuals that had been sitting in a state hospital their whole lives or had no intervention. So there were a lot of growth and development that, that occurred there. Uh, now we have uh, the ABA kind of growing and, and such. Jack Michael at the same time was teaching from Skinner's book Verbal Behavior every semester and he went to Western Michigan University in 1967 and from that year on every year there was a course in verbal behavior. So here we are now back in 73, 74 and we're now taking Jack's verbal behavior class and, and uh, uh, working with kids with problems and, and Jack began to come out to the, the center and Jack had a strong interest in sign language, which uh, uh, one of his research colleagues in the 1960s at, at Arizona State was Lee Meyerson. And Lee Meyerson was uh, deaf, and Lee Meyerson had gotten him interested in, in the deaf population in sign language. And uh, when he would come out to our center, uh, Jack would... would uh, We'd be working with kids, and Jack would say, "Well, get, teach them to man. How do you teach them? Get them to man." And I'd, I'd say to Jack, "Well, how do you do that, Jack? How do we get them to man?" And Jack would say, "I don't know. Let's figure it out. What, what's he want? He wants a certain thing." And uh, we begin to kind of fiddle around with with that. And there've been some other things that that uh, had occurred, but Jack took a really strong interest in trying to see through the application of verbal behavior. That is, let's, let's see if we can get this to work. So myself and a number of, of my colleagues there at, at the multi handicap Center begin a series of projects of how to do man training, how to do TAC training. Did the man lead to the TAC? Did the TAC lead to the man? If you taught a TAC, do you get into verbal? And, and uh, uh, through 1974, 75, 76, uh, uh, we begin this series of projects, and, and at the same time, uh, the Midwestern Association for Behavior Analysis uh, was developed. So, uh, 1975 was the first MABA conference, and Jerry Shook, who was our, our director uh, at MultiCap, took us all to MABA. And here we are, all a bunch of young graduate students, and going to our first conference, which was at the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago and uh, had the opportunity to interact with the names of people that we had seen and read about in all of our our work. You know, people like Bear and Wolf and Risley and Dick Fox and Nate Azarin and Sid Bijou and Murray Sidman, Charlie Catania, all of these people, Willard Day, we saw Skinner, got to meet Skinner, Fred Keller, and it was amazing how accessible these individuals were. Fred Keller, for example, was so willing to sit down and talk to students, and he'd spend a lot of time talking with us and he took a strong interest in in the verbal behavior projects that we were doing and uh, so did Skinner and uh, uh, the next year we then presented some of our projects and uh, there are a few other people around the country that were doing this Joe Pear at the University of Manitoba and, and Gary Martin but uh, uh, specifically Joe Pear and his students were doing verbal behavior uh, uh, research we had contacted uh, uh, Joe Spradlin and uh, he gave us a lot of information and, and such about uh, verbal behavior. And, and so uh, as I, uh, when I became a, a doctoral student, which was 1977 at, at Western, uh, the way Jack Michael's system was set up, like many other professors, was that as a PhD student, you had a collection of master's students that you were sort of their mentor. And part of that mentorship was that you participated and helped them with their master's thesis. So I had maybe, uh, over the course of the years, maybe a dozen or 15 or so of Jack Michael's master's students that all worked for Jerry Shook at the multi Handicap Center. And we all did this systematic collection of, of research, most of which were master's thesis or doctoral dissertations, which we all presented at MABA uh, uh, over the years. And uh, collectively, that uh, set of, of research kind of laid out man training, TAC training, the, the assessment program, all of that were, were parts of that. Over the course between 1975 and 1980, 
we ran uh, approximately 50 research studies in, in this uh, uh, school. Uh, in 1983, we published in the Verbal Behavior Journal a, a, a reference list, a citation list. And in that, you'll see those about 30 or 40 of those papers if you go back in the archives of the, the Verbal Behavior Journal. Uh, and and um, again, in there were studies like, for example, Janae Hall's master's thesis was on the separation between the man and the tax. Some of you may have seen that paper. And we had uh, 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 a situation where we'd had, we had a couple of deaf individuals come out of the state hospital as teenagers and were, were at lots of aggressive behavior and, and behavior problems. And, and this one guy, he loved coffee. And he could tack the entire chain of making coffee. He could tack the coffee, cat tack the spoon. You show him a spoon, he could sign spoon, he could sign coffee. He could sign hot, he could sign water, he could complete the chain. But if any one item of that chain was missing, uh, for example, you give him the coffee, you give him the hot water, but no cup. If the cup is missing on the table, uh, what he would do is aggress. He, he got pissed off. I can't have my coffee. And he would uh, flip tables and, and get angry. Yet you show him a cup and he could tack the cup. So this was some of the things we would discover clinically, here's a problem where somebody can engage in this behavior under these types of contingencies, but not under these other ones. So in the absence of a cup, when a cup was valuable, that is, we created an establishing operation by presenting the coffee, the, the spoon, and so on, and then you remove the, the, the item that he needs is not there, uh, within a few trials, we're able to teach him the man for cup. Then we'd remove the spoon, same thing, he'd aggress. Took us some training trials. Pretty soon, we taught him to man for the missing spoon. And after about uh, four or five, I don't know, maybe it was two or three different chains of behavior, like we did a varieties of other things, making soup. Then uh, we began to get some generalization. And as we began to find that he could man for a missing item on the first trial, provided he had some of the training that that we had done. And that's where our our concept of initially. Uh, uh, an interrupted chain with a with a um, uh, kind of blocked response uh, situation, creating an establishing operation, uh, and then some of our transfer of stimulus control or transfer control procedures um, were leading us to more effective man training. Uh, and again, kind of, of identifying that starting out, they were functionally independent. And this stuff to us was really exciting. Well, that was Janae's master's thesis. Uh, which uh, we eventually published in 1987, but we ran that in 1977 or 78. Uh, and again, at this time period, uh, uh, there were not a lot of other people doing verbal behavior research. Uh, yet we went to MAB every year and we would, we would present this. Uh, there were a couple of other lines of research that were going on. Uh, one was Willard Day's. Now, Willard Day was at the University of Nevada, Reno, and Willard was doing more complex kind of conceptual research with typical adults uh, looking at, at complex uh, issues and such. Uh, and Kurt Salzinger uh, in New York was also doing clinical uh, research. But there was this small collection of people that were doing man tact interverbal research with uh, 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 people with language delays of one type or another. Perhaps, excuse me, one of the most significant events in, in the development of all of this was uh, a meeting that occurred in 1977 at ABBA. And in that meeting, uh, the meeting was chaired by Jack Michael and, and one of his students from the University of Arizona uh, uh, named Scott Wood. Scott Wood was on the faculty at Drake University. And Jack and Scott chaired a session called uh, uh, Teachers of Verbal Behavior or Those Who Would Like to Be. And in that session, uh, the room was packed. I mean, there were probably 100, 200 people there. Sigrid, you may have been there. I, I, you were there? Okay, so there were uh, uh, large numbers of people there. And, and at, that, at that meeting, people got up and talked about what needed to happen and, and what, what needed to be done in the field. Skinner got up and talked about how difficult... Uh, uh, it was to teach verbal behavior. And he admitted, he said, I, I, I did a terrible job at trying to teach my own book that it was very difficult to do. And people brought up other issues like there's, there's not a lot of research in the field, there's not a lot of materials available, that we need to take some action of some sort. And, and that's what Jack and, and Scott were trying to coordinate. Uh, and again, people were getting up and, and making suggestions. Uh, that meeting... Uh, really constituted the first special interest group for ABBA. Uh, 
Uh, that is, that was that kind of led to here's a special topic within behavior analysis. It's a little bit different than just the applied area, the experimental area, the conceptual area, but verbal behavior is a special topic. Uh, and out of that meeting uh, came a number of action items of, of things that needed to be done, suggestions of things like uh, uh, let's get the William James lectures, which were uh, some notes that. that uh, uh, kind of a, a, an early version of the book, Verbal Behavior, get that available. Skinner put that out in 1947. The Hefferlein notes, which were Skinner's lecture notes from when he taught verbal behavior, those uh, we got out and made those available. You can still get, a, you can get access to those now, and it gives you a good historical perspective of where the book Verbal Behavior came from and some of the historical topics and such. Uh, but one of the biggest things we kind of begin to talk about was uh, coming up with some way to, to get this content published. And we had struggled in, in, in the 70s in the sense that verbal behavior research was not the same kind of research that was being published in Java at the time. That is, it was very difficult, for example, to do reversal designs. The kind of methodology that evolved in applied behavior analysis at the time was often not quite conducive to verbal behavior uh, and that was part of what Willard Day was doing. He had a concept called radical methodology, which is another discussion. But Willard also raised a lot of points with the difficulty of structural methodological approaches to research. And Java kind of was characteristic of that. Very, very predictable designs. And we used to draw the graphs when we were trying to do Java research, where you would know what your effects were going to be before you ran the research. And for many of us, that didn't constitute what we were interested in, and that was exploration and, and science and such. Um, but Java didn't like verbal behavior research. There's almost no studies in Java on verbal behavior research. They thought it was too experimental, too, too uh, conceptual. Jayab didn't like it. Uh, Jayab thought the verbal behavior stuff was too applied. So our two flagship journals, neither one of them, uh, the board of editors at the time in the 70s, were not really predisposed to verbal behavior type research. And, and so uh, there was difficulty in getting the kind of things that we were interested in uh, published at the time. Now, coming out of that 1977 meeting was also the discussion then of getting some kind of, of newsletter together, getting some kind of information more accessible to, to people. And uh, uh, throughout the, the rest of the 70s, we, we continued that research. And, and uh, uh, again, I'd say that there were the two main players, at least, I think, that, that had the biggest impact on me were certainly Jack Michael for providing me with the, the repertoires that I needed to do this, but the constant guidance. So Jack, I was Jack's teaching assistant for a number of years, and, and again, Jack would come out to uh, Calmos Valley Multi Handicap Center on a weekly basis. So he was a very active participant. I mean, Jack should have been co-author on absolutely everything we did, uh, but Jack never wanted to be co-author. He always say, "Just acknowledge me," and, and so. Uh, but yet, uh, uh, he was a piece of of all of that. The second individual was Joe Spradlin, and Joe was again very generous with with what he had done and. Uh, uh, his Parsons language sample, again, was the first application to language assessment using Skinner's concepts of verbal behavior. And I had contacted Joe, and I, I used that tool for my doctoral dissertation, which was uh, something like the application of Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior. That, that uh, was my doctoral dissertation. And in that, I, I used Joe Spradlin's Parsons language sample assessment to assess all of my, my participants' verbal skills uh, when they entered the, the study that I was doing. And I uh, had contacted Joe and I'd said, you know, I'd, I'd love your assessment tool, but uh, I, I need to make some changes in it. And, and uh, for example, his manned uh, examples were things like, now remember, this came from Parsons State Hospital with adult patients. And it would say, one of his manned example was, give the patient a cigarette and see if he mans for a lighter. And I said, well, can I change that where I give the kid some ice cream and see if he mans for a spoon? And can I make some modifications in your assessment tool? And Joe wrote back uh, and said that I could do anything I wanted to the tool that he'd put it out. This was 15 years now. He'd put it out 15 years ago. And it almost has never been cited, never been used. It's not available anymore. Uh, 
and that he was thrilled that somebody was actually using it and had seen it. But he, he said, go ahead and do whatever you want uh, uh, with that tool, uh, which I, I did and, and modified. And, and uh, that tool was basically the basis. In 1983, uh, I published a chapter called Language Assessment in a book by Steve Bruning and Johnny Madsen. And in that 1983 book, book chapter, I basically transformed uh, uh, Joe Spradlin's assessment into uh, a more modern version directly applied to kids with autism and begin to make that transition, which uh, about 10 years later morphed into the ABLES assessment tool and now the VB map. So there's about a 45-year or really 50-year history of the, the VB map tool that I have today that started with Joe Spradlin was conceptually guided by Jack Michael and kind of through that that whole progression. Uh, but again, uh, maybe going back to, to uh, uh, that 1977 meeting, here was a group of people that were committed to somehow getting Skinner's conceptual analysis of language out there. In 1978, uh, uh, Skinner uh, wrote a chapter, he had a book called uh, Reflections on Behaviorism in Society, and in that book he has a collection of papers that he had written, and in one of the papers, and this is 1978, he said, the book Verbal Behavior will prove to be my most important work. And that, that statement, uh, again, uh, has been so inspirational for me, because you look at, here's everything that Skinner, you know, all the things that Skinner has contributed in terms of the distinction between operant and respondent conditioning, absolutely huge. Uh, the basic concepts of extinction, reinforcement, reinforcement schedules, behavior analysis as we know it uh, is pretty close to the basic concepts and principles that Skinner put out in 1938 in the book Behavior of Organisms. And here he is saying this book, Verbal Behavior, which the field pretty much rejected when it came out, 20 years later he says this will prove to be my most important work. Why? And I think the major reason is that human language, verbal behavior, is the most important aspect of human behavior. That is, language is what, what we all gets us in wars. It's conversation, thinking, education. We spend so much time in our verbal repertoires. And the role that that plays on day-to-day -day human behavior is absolutely huge, far more significant than the kind of simple behaviors that I often saw in, in Java, while it's important to, to look at certain behaviors, uh, it's verbal behavior that really is, is the essence of human behavior. And it's also the topic of most psychology. If you look at any intro psych book, every single chapter in that book has something to do with verbal behavior, perception, creativity, problem solving. Those all involve the verbal repertoires. And basically, Skinner's saying that if we don't have a behavioral analysis of language, we can't participate in that argument, that discussion. If we don't have a behavioral analysis of where does creativity, what's that about, and, 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 and such, uh, we have no, no uh, uh, seat at the table. And, and so, again, from Skinner's point of view, it's, it's the study of, of language that's really going to advance or, or, or move us forward in, the, in this field. And that was his main point in the 1978 paper. Yet here we are in 1978, 21 years after the, the book had been published. And also that same year, uh, uh, even though it was a year late, we had a symposium at, at now I think it was ABBA, maybe it was still MABA, called Skinner's Book, Verbal Behavior, 20 Years Later. And uh, I think Jack Michael Willard Day, Skinner was on the panel, um, Charlie Catania, uh, other people may have been on that, that panel. And again, it was one of those discussions where people said, it's been 20 years. It's about time we get on with the study of verbal behavior. And a lot of, a lot of people raised issues. But uh, clearly, if, uh, what, what some people did, specifically an individual named John Eshelman, uh, published a paper in 1991 where what John did was go back and uh, look at the number of presentations at ABBA that were on verbal behavior, the number of publications on verbal behavior, and again begin to track uh, a history uh, with uh, six cycle log charts of looking at acceleration of verbal behavior research. And in 1991, he published a really nice paper that, excuse me, showed this history of the acceleration of verbal behavior during the 19, uh, uh, early 
early 1970s up through the 1980s and ending at, at, at uh, 1991. And again, things were beginning to pick up steam. Now, the uh, special interest group was formed in, in 1978, and that was the first year ABBA officially had special interest groups. And, and actually, the way it sort of started was uh, I was on the program committee at that time, and, and Brian Iwata and Art Snapper uh, were the chairs that year. And Art uh, scheduled the experimental presentations. Brian Iwata did the applied. Linda Pay, ha uh, Hayes, Linda Parrott at that time, Linda Hayes was the conceptual. And this group allowed me to track verbal behavior separate. So we had four tracks in the ABBA program, experimental, applied, conceptual, and verbal behavior. And so, and this was part of something that had come out of the 77 meeting, that there was enough big names and powerful people that kind of put pressure on ABBA to say, we want to track verbal behavior separate. We want to have a special track for verbal behavior. And at the same time, then, some of the clinical people said, well, we'd like a special track for the clinical people as well. And so we kind of worked that in. And, and actually, I, I think there are about three or four special groups we ended up doing by the 1979 ABBA program book. And uh, by then, we had six or seven or eight special interest groups. Now, I think there may be 50, 60, 70 different special interest groups within ABBA. But verbal behavior was one of the first ones. Uh, and and uh, as time went on, uh, we began to say, let's, let's get a newsletter, uh, get some information out. And so uh, I actually started working on this in about 1979 or 1980. And I, I graduated from Western Michigan in 1980 and almost had the first newsletter done. And then I got a job in California, my first job after the Ph.D. program, and, and uh, went to work for the Regional Center of the East Bay uh, in Oakland, and uh, there were 6,000 clients, and I was the only behavior, uh, uh, behavioral psychologist in the system, and my job was to deal with the behavior problems of these 6,000 clients, which was a little absurd. Um, uh, so I never got back to the newsletter, and I never finished it, I never uh, completed it. Uh, around 1981, I, I uh, uh, got Kent Johnson who some of you may know for his work with uh, Head Sprout and, and Morning Star and, and some of those. Uh, Kent was very interested in verbal behavior. He uh, uh, was a student of Beth Sulcer Azaroff, and Kent and Phil Chase had worked together on a variety of verbal behavior projects. And, and uh, I said, Kent, you know, let's help me get this newsletter out. Let's, let's team up on this. And, and Kent and I had met actually in Berkeley uh, somewhere around 1981 and kind of hammered out the first issue of what we called VB News, Verbal Behavior News, VB News, and uh, uh, with the SIG, what we had, and, and the SIG had authorized, this special interest group had said, let's do a newsletter, uh, I, I was the editor of it, and we had said, let's set a four-page limit that you can only have a four-page paper uh, in this newsletter, and so the first newsletter had uh, four four-page papers in it, one by Jack, the first paper was by Jack Michael, Second paper was by Ernie Vargas. Uh, the third paper was by myself and Jim Partington on a reference list of research that had been done. And then the fourth paper was a paper by Kent Johnson. So here Kent and I were editors of the thing. We had to do half the work. Uh, uh, and that's the way those things sort of work. The, uh, the next year, and then I, I would, Kent and I took them then to ABBA. And uh, that's where my reputation for five bucks a piece, I was selling them for five dollars a piece. So it was a $5 donation to the Verbal Behavior SIG uh, and helped offset the, the printing costs and so on of, of the newsletter. I think we probably sold about maybe 30, 40, 50, 60, something like that. And we began to then uh, take uh, memberships for the SIG and people would pay $5 to join the Verbal Behavior Special Interest Group and they would get the newsletter. Uh, the next year, we had several submissions and we had maybe 10 papers or so for volume two of, of the newsletter and we sold several hundred at ABBA and, and uh, we began to get a lot more um, larger donations. Um, uh, Skinner uh, sent us, I, it seems to me Skinner sent us about a thousand dollars. He sent us over time, he sent me several different checks to try and get the, the verbal behavior uh, uh, a newsletter up and running and we had the discussion that it was time to move it from a newsletter to a journal. 
uh, and to remove the four-page limit. So we, we must have had that discussion somewhere around 1984, I believe, 1983 or 84. We would made the decision uh, as a special interest group to uh, move it to a full-fledged journal. And uh, we established an editorial board. I was the, the editor of the journal, and, and uh, um, if you look at the volume three, or volume, maybe beginning with volume four, no, it was volume three, was the first one we called The Analysis of Verbal Behavior. And in that volume, you'll see the board of editors removed the, the page restriction and went to a peer review uh, model. That is, rather than a couple of us kind of sitting around, for that issue, Joe Spradlin was my associate editor. So Joe Spradlin and I did volume three of the Verbal Behavior Journal, and uh, he helped me coordinate manuscripts and kind of mentored me on on uh, that level of, of, of professional activities. And um, uh, we put together, I think, a, a pretty reasonable uh, journal at that time. Uh, volume 4 then came out in 1985, uh, a little bit thinner of a volume, no, maybe about the same. And we began to pick up momentum. I had uh, uh, started to receive a number of contributions from people that we established a life membership. So we had nine people who donated $250 a piece uh, to be life members of the Verbal Behavior SIG. And those, uh, some of those life members were Don Baer, Murray Sidman, um, Jerry Shook was one of those individuals. Uh, and we promised them they'd get a free issue every year for the rest of their lives. And those people that are still alive do still get the free issue. I think we're going into issue number 29 or 30 of the Verbal Behavior Journal. So their $250 has, has uh, been paid back quite handsomely. Uh, so uh, in 1985, we began to, uh, by 1985, we began to get a lot of submissions and they were uh, much more empirically oriented papers. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, people began to publish at the time, there's a, we got a ton of negative press, which was really unfortunate. Uh, in 1983, there was a paper published by, unfortunately, one of Jack's doctoral students, Gray Osborne, and Gina Green, who you may know, Gina Green, McPherson, Green, Osborne, and Marilyn Bonham. In 1983, in the Behavior Analyst, published a paper called A Citation, a uh, Review of Citations from Skinner's Book, Verbal Behavior. And in that article, they identified something like eight or 900 citations in the research citations in the literature to Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, and then concluded that there were only something like uh, 20 or 30 empirical investigations. All the rest were conceptual theoretical papers, and they concluded in that paper that there's no evidence that there will ever be an experimental uh, uh, program based on Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior. There'll never be a research program. If the past is any predictor of the future, which is the line they used, uh, it's very doubtful Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, is ever going to go anywhere. Uh, and, and that article pissed me off more than anything. And, and I, I let off several of my papers with that citation of saying, you know, my mission here is to, is to prove them wrong, that Skinner's book is loaded with experimental research. On page 12 of Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, he says, there are technical applications, there are practical and technical applications at every step of the analysis. So starting out the book, he's telling us this stuff can be applied, that this concept of the man has huge implications, and there are applications at every step. And, and there are times like that first paragraph of the man chapter, we got at least five master's thesis out of one paragraph. And that's the way that book is so rich and so loaded with analyses that you can take something like, like Skinner's presentation of automatic reinforcement is, is uh, uh, pretty rich in that book. And that led us to that whole line of research on infant babbling and automatic reinforcement. All the pairing uh, stuff that we've done over the years came from that book. Uh, the research on motivating operations uh, and, and, and such. The book is loaded with potential experimental and, and applied topics. Uh, in 1991, in response to the, the Gray Osborne and Gina Green paper, I published something called 301 Research Topics from Skinner's Book, Verbal Behavior. And I start that, that paper right out pointing out that that citation index uh, uh, was misleading and that, that uh, there's certainly a lot of 
it, it wasn't an issue that the book cannot be experimentally or applied, uh, developed in, a, in an applied manner. Uh, it wasn't a paucity of topics. It was a paucity of researchers. There simply weren't enough behavior analysts that were doing verbal behavior stuff. It was, you know, a few dozen, maybe 20, 40, 60 people, and, and the field had, had thousands of people in it, yet there was not a lot of people doing verbal behavior research. So what I did was go through Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, and, then, and identified 30 different topic areas, the man, the tact, automatic reinforcement, uh, research with the geriatric population, non-humans, the ape language research, child development, and then identified 10 potential research topics for each one of, of those areas, uh, just as suggestions to say, you know, here's a topic to study. Look at, does the tact lead to an interverbal? Is, is the tact and the interverbal the same? Here could be a whole line of research on, on looking at those, those differences. Skinner said it conceptually, and conceptually, there are different antecedents. Is the EO the same as the SD? You know, that boils down to the man tact distinction. Is a discriminative stimulus the same antecedent as a motivated variable? I had many arguments with Murray Sidman, who just insisted there was no distinction between the motivating variable and the discriminative stimulus. Yet, within a Skinnerian analysis, the motivating variable is not the same as the discriminative stimulus. Uh, and that is another topic in terms of Sidman avoidance, which was not an SD effect, but an MO effect, which never sat well with Sidman. But uh, uh, if we look at the research topics that are, that are in that book, they essentially are endless. And, and again, it's, it's because the topic of human language is endless. You look at the role that, again, I had mentioned that language plays in our day-to-day -day behavior, our intellectual behavior, profession, academic behavior. All of those then uh, can benefit from a behavioral analysis of, of language. Uh, so uh, uh, in the mid-80s, uh, the field kind of began to take off. Now, again, Skinner had contributed uh, a fair amount of money to it. Uh, uh, these uh, people, the, the nine people and their $250 contributed to it, uh, and we began to grow. And by volume six, volume seven, volume six was 1986, volume seven, 1987, uh, we were publishing maybe 10 to 12 uh, papers a year uh, uh, in the Rural Behavior Journal. And the program book at ABBA was now, uh, there, was, there was dozens, I don't know what the exact number was, probably 40, 50, 60 empirically based studies relating uh, to verbal behavior in one way or another. So the field kind of began to, to grow and things uh, began to happen. Uh, uh, I received a series of letters from Skinner and I, I, I sent Sigrid one of those letters. I don't know if you, did you get the letter I sent today? You've got it right there. Uh, well, uh, Skinner and I had gone back and forth. Uh, in, in those days, you know, people wrote actual letters, which was kind of nice because you got a hard copy of something. And in this particular letter I'd sent that uh, I'd been trying to get Skinner to submit something for the Verbal Behavior Journal. And he he uh, agreed that he would find something. But why I sent that was uh, the last sentence he said on there was, it's, it's good to see the verbal behavior area kind of come into life. It's about time. And Skinner was really so excited to see this topic of verbal behavior finally being addressed within the, the field of behavior analysis. Uh, there was another letter he sent me. Uh, Terry Knapp did a review of Jerome Bruner's book. And in there, Terry Knapp pointed out how Jerome Bruner had really made a behavioral analysis of some of the topics of language. And Skinner wrote, uh, it's so exciting to see Jerome Bruner finally coming around to my way of thinking. And uh, uh, for him, it was like he's a kid in the candy shop. He was so excited about the verbal behavior uh, development. And, and um, uh, you know, it was kind of fun to see. And it was, it was fun to see it finally happening. But for most of us, it just wasn't happening fast enough. You know, here it was 87. We were 30 years uh, past the publication of the book. That year, I think we also did a... Uh, symposium at ABBA 30 years uh, after the book was published. And again, the issue was we've got to get empirical research going in this field. There's just so many topics that need to be studied. And, and gradually the, 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 the journal continued to, to grow in size. I think by volume 10, we were 200 pages. We, uh, our, our submission rate was pretty high. Uh, 
um, our, our acceptance into uh, applied fields uh, was increasing. Now, if we look at, at uh, uh, journals like JABA, um, one major topic that relates to verbal behavior is the whole issue of the motivating variable, the motivating operations and the relationship to the man. And one thing that always kind of bothered me a little bit was um, JABA in its first 10 years, 1968 to 1978, in the index of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, there's not a single citation index to motivation. There's not a single citation index to the establishing operation. Now, those concepts were around. Skinner introduced the deprivation, satiation, aversive stimulation in 1938 as an alternative to drive. And yet, the applied field had really made no use of motivating variables in Java. 1978 to 1988, again, that 10-year period, not a single citation to motivation in the index of Java. Now, all the rest of psychology is talking about motivation. Uh, motivation is a huge independent variable in human behavior, yet our applied field completely neglected the concept of motivation. And in part, that was my feeling as to why the applied field rejected the whole concept of the man. The man was uh, under the functional control of motivating variables, but yet here we had a majority of people in our field that completely neglected motivating variables as an independent variable and those that would argue against its independence. Next 10 years of Java, 1988 to 1998, so 30 years of Java. If you look in the index of that 30-year volume, there are five citations to motivation, still none to establishing operations. So for the first 30 years of Java, there's not a single paper on looking at establishing operations as an independent variable or, or anywhere uh, within, within the, dis, uh, the, the, the line of research. The five papers on motivation, all five of them treated motivation as a consequence. That is, motivation was considered to be after behavior. Well, that was never Skinner's analysis. Motivation from a Skinnerian uh, standpoint is an antecedent event. It's an evocative effect. That is, the value is established. That is, for example, food deprivation increases the value of food as a reinforcer. Uh, that increased value evokes behavior of, say, going to a refrigerator. Getting food out of the refrigerator is a consequence. That strengthens then the behavior of going to the refrigerator. Those are two very separate behavioral principles, separate behavioral effects. But here, Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis is treating motivation as a consequence. Uh, and that got people going in, in the wrong direction, I think. But at least motivation made it in there. But it screwed up people's view of how motivation works in a behavioral analysis. So still, here we are, 1998. I mean, that's only 15 years ago that we're looking at these kinds of core concepts that underlie verbal behavior that just have not been well worked into behavior analysis. And, and that, that, that's still a problem today, without a doubt. But it's, it, it, it's, it's certainly changed. Um, uh, I think we can thank Brian Iwata for doing a lot of the research on, on uh, aggressive behavior and self-injurious behavior and looking at the role of, of establishing operations in, in that. So now in Java, we see a nice line of research by the next... 10 years, you see there are now 30, 40, 50 papers in there on man training, establishing operations, and so on. But it took 30 years to get this to happen, which was kind of surprising. Well, by the mid-1990s, uh, 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 we were in maybe volume 12, 13, 14 of the, of the Verbal Behavior Journal, and it was pretty healthy. Now, each year... Um, uh, we were printing larger and larger issues, and uh, costs were kind of going up, and uh, we, we couldn't support it. And um, I, I ended up supporting the journal uh, and operating out of my garage, basically, for its first 15 years or so. And I'd run up maybe, I don't know, fifteen or $20,000 in, in debt, but I had tons of back issues. I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of back issues of, of the, the journals. Um, and that's where, you know, again, I got the reputation of five bucks a piece going to ABBA, still trying to sell them. Now they, I think they were 15 a piece, and I was selling them for three for $10 and, and basically trying to get my money back um, or at least break even and kind of keep a little quiet to my wife as to exactly how much I had spent on the Verbal Behavior Journal. Um, but... Uh, 
uh, at that time, uh, ABBA became more and more interested. And I think at that time, in fact, I'm sure at that time, Sigrid was president of ABBA and helped kind of convince some of the board members of ABBA that it might be a good idea to have ABBA uh, publish the Verbal Behavior Journal. And uh, Sigrid, along with uh, John Bailey and Charlie Catania and other, uh, some of the other members of the board, um, uh, and, and, and Maria Malak, had uh, over a course, and I think it must have taken us about two years to make the transition from uh, me running the journal to having ABBA take over and, and run the journal. And, and what I was after was to have ABBA buy all my back issues uh, for the debt that I had. And that's ultimately what we ended up uh, working out was ABBA paid me for all the back issues. I sent all the back issues to ABBA. And ABBA took on publishing the journal beginning with volume 15. Uh, in volume 14, I wrote an editorial, and it was my last editorial. So some of the points I've raised here are, are in that, that uh, editorial of, of what some of the history consisted of. Uh, but to me, that was, that was one of the most satisfying things, and I, and I certainly thank Sigrid and everybody else for making that happen. Because it gave the journal legitimacy. To be able to have the journal published by ABBA made it very, very different than it coming out of my garage or just something, my newsletter and, and all of that. And, and it needed to have some kind of credibility. It needed to have it published by an organization before verbal behavior would be taken seriously. And again, that was in the mid-1990s. Um, and I, I think that also contributed to uh, its increased exposure. ABBA then began to advertise it more. It was in the ABBA program book. Uh, they had advertisements in the Behavior Analyst at the time, which was the, the other journal that they were publishing. Um, we still, at that time, weren't well accepted in Java or JAB. In the 90s, there just weren't many Java studies about verbal behavior. Uh, a, a few began to occur. Uh, but each year, then, the journal became uh, better and better. Hank Schlinger took over as the editor after me. Uh, after Hank was Sam Leagland. Uh, after Sam Leagland, Jack Michael was the editor of the journal for uh, 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 two terms. Uh, Kyle Miguel then was the editor after Jack, and now Anna Peterstadter is the editor. So uh, the journal now then began to be treated like a real journal with rotating boards. Uh, I mean, I used to beg people to be on the board and never let them off once they got on the board. I was like, you can't, you can't leave me. I need you. Uh, now we see it's rotated, and and we have new editors. I think I was editor for 14 years, and that's not the way it should be. We should have a three-year term, which is what was established. Uh, and and again, I think the journal has has uh, taken on a credit a strong uh, credibility that it didn't have. But here's a really nice to me uh, effect: is that now in almost every issue of Java. You're going to find three, four, five, sometimes six or seven papers that cite Skinner's verbal behavior that are empirical papers on some aspect of, of verbal behavior, and it's broadening out significantly. We're seeing more research on geriatrics, for example, and the deterioration of the verbal repertoire. It's not only Java, but it's the autism journals. It's ABBA's new practitioner journal. Now has articles in it on... on uh, uh, Verbal behavior. Vince Carbone just published a paper on the conditioned establishing operation, reflexive CEOs, and mans to remove aversives, and so on. Uh, there's also a paper in there on man tact distinction and such. All the autism journals uh, are now increasingly uh, publishing more and more papers on verbal behavior. I'd like to think at some point soon we'll have John Eshelman, and I've talked to him about this the last couple of years at ABBA, do a, a kind of return back to his 1991 acceleration chart where he showed that verbal behavior, verbal behavior research was uh, accelerating at a three times level, that if he went back and looked at what's now in the verbal behavior research area, there are hundreds of studies. Uh, and, you know, it, one of the things I often say to Julie Vargas, who's Skinner's daughter, is how thrilled Skinner would be in 2013 to look at finally, it's about time, finally, that this analysis, which he believed would be his most important work, is finally reaching the field of behavior analysis. It's finally having uh, an effect on the field. And I'll, I'll close with this particular statement from Jack Michael. And, and, and again, I, uh, 
I, I can't stress more the role that Jack has played in teaching so many people in our field, not just verbal behavior, but behavior analysis in general, mainly from the conceptual level and, and the and as well as the applied level. But Jack used to often say in the 70s that that he felt that that Skinner's book would never win the conceptual battle. We could argue about Skinner versus Chomsky, and just like arguing with cognitive psychologists, you know, I, I, after about 10 years, you kind of forget it because you're not going to get very far with the hardcore cognitive psychologists. But what he had said was that in order for verbal behavior to have a big impact on the field, we got to solve a problem. We've got to come up with some, verbal behavior has got to solve some human problem that analysis in some way that gets us mass attention. And at the time, we all thought it would be in education. We thought it would be in reading, that the application of Skinner's analysis to, to regular education would, would have a huge impact. People cared about knowledge level and so on. Excuse me. Well, it turns out we never got, we never won that war so much, although there's certainly improvement in, in that area. Uh, turns out it's autism that if we look at the impact of behavior analysis on the treatment of kids with autism, we've changed a lot of lives and we've had an impact that no other field has been able to have. And being able to take a nonverbal child that may be 10 years old or, or, or so and teach them their first man in a matter of minutes using uh, not just behavioral technology but the concept of the establishing operation and its relationship to man uh, it was very, very thrilling. And now we're seeing that around the world, we're seeing change. Uh, uh, I was just in Italy last month and looking at what's happening in Italy and the interest in behavior analysis is really exciting. They see it work. They see that what we bring to the table is changing the lives of kids and it's a huge problem and issue around the world of how do you work with kids with autism. And, and again, the suggestion is uh, verbal behavior has helped advance our understanding of not only the issues, but assessment uh, 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 tools as well as intervention tools. And um, uh, that's given us, I think, the opening in many ways to uh, be heard in other areas. That is, the success of behavior analysis with autism is opening a few doors for us in education. It's opening doors for us in, in other areas like geriatrics, as I had mentioned before. Uh, and as we look at the some of us baby boomers reaching that stage, Jack Michael said about a, a oh, maybe six months ago at a presentation, he got up, no, it's the verbal behavior SIG. Last year in May at ABBA, he got up and said how uh, excited he was to see all the research now going on in geriatrics because he's now has an interest in that field. Uh, Jack is, of course, now 87 years old uh, and, and still around. But uh, uh, that's kind of the history, I guess, uh, at least one version of it. And it certainly has been a, a wonderful ride and experience. Uh, this has been a field that I've never looked back at after stumbling into Kalamazoo as a naive kid and kind of being shaped by Jerry Shook and Jack Michael and Joe Spradlin and hundreds of other individuals like Dick Millad and, and, and so on at Western Michigan University. Uh, and I'm thrilled that you guys have an interest in this area. Thank you.